Hello, welcome to Insights, Newcastle University's public lectures programme. My name is Martin Farr, I'm co-chair of the committee. It's been a great pleasure to welcome you to the last public lecture of the year and fingers crossed our last virtual lecture. We're back in person in the spring. Uh, our speaker this evening is Professor Mary Herbert, who will be speaking to us on the subject of beauty at the beginning of life. I'll be here in about half an hour's time for questions and comments to our speaker live. If you'd like to make any comments or ask some questions, please do so in the chat box on our YouTube page or on Twitter. Our handle is at InsightsNCL and you can tag your comments with hashtag InsightsNCL. I'll hand over now to our, our introducer for our speaker this evening, who is Professor Joris Feltman. My name is Joris Feltman and it's a great pleasure to introduce Mary Herbert to you all. Mary is absolutely one of Newcastle's most remarkable scientists, a world-class researcher in human embryology. Not only has she made fundamental discoveries that provide insight into basic processes such as reproductive aging, she also has played and still plays a leading role in advancing the safe use of reproductive technologies and its application to prevent passing on genetic diseases. To summarize her career is not easy, but let me give you a few highlights. In 1999, she set up the first IVF clinic in the northeast of England here in Newcastle, together with Alison Murdoch. In 1998, she obtained her PhD, studying the quality of embryos in IVF transfer. She developed a system that she patented to improve the success of the IVF procedure. She and her team have provided fundamental insight into chromosome segregation during meiosis, and the impact of aging, especially during female aging of the oocytes. She and her team have developed IVF approaches that enable women suffering from severe mitochondrial disease to have a genetically related child without that disease. This had led to a change in the UK law in 2015 and is now being applied in a clinical research study. She's received a number of prestigious awards, including the Welcome Biomedical Imaging Award, the Blueprint Award, the Business of Life Innovation Award, and she's an elected fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences. Most important for you, she's also a fantastic public speaker. And one of the things that she has done is she's given a prestigious TED talk in 2018. You can still find this on YouTube, so I highly recommend that. Um, but I'm sure you're gonna enjoy this inside lecture very much. Mary, the floor is yours. Thank you, Joris, and thank you to the organizers of the Insights uh, series for inviting me to come and talk to you about our work. So I work as part of the reproduction development and child health research theme here in Newcastle. And we work on the very earliest stages of human development, and particularly interested in female fertility. And in this talk, I'll be taking you through from the fertilized egg to development of the embryo to a stage where it can implant to give rise to a viable pregnancy and how that embryo at a very early stage of development then makes an investment in transmitting its genome to the next generation by forming, forming oocytes, which will then mature into eggs when they, when, when, during adult life. So I'm going to take you on a quick tour around the circle of life and then talk about the things that can go wrong and the things we try to do to reduce risk. But before I start, I'd like to acknowledge a great pioneer of, of this field, Bob Edwards. He pioneered IVF treatment in human uh, in, and with the birth of Louise Brown in July 1978, marked the beginning of a, of a revolution in human reproductive health. Was the, she was the first of 8 million babies estimated to be currently conceived through, 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 through um, assisted conception procedures. And here are Louise, Louise, here's Louise with her parents and the first of many families to be founded using these techniques. So I'm going to start us here with the fertilized egg. This is a human fertilized egg, a single cell from which we all begin life. And whether this egg goes on to form a healthy baby depends largely on the DNA it inherits from its parents. And this process is very inefficient. About 75% of fertilized eggs do not develop to the stage where they can form a viable pregnancy. Now, the, at fertilization, we have three genomes. We have two nuclear genomes. And the nuclear genome is the, it con, 
contains the DNA that gives us all our heritable traits. And we inherit one copy of each chromosome. The DNA is packaged into linear molecules for chromosomes. And in all humans have 46 chromosomes, 23 pairs, one pair we inherit from the egg and one pair we inherit from the sperm. And the fertilized egg also contains mitochondrial DNA, which is contained in mitochondria, which are scattered throughout the cytoplasm. Now, the main job of the mitochondria is, produ is to produce the energy our cells need to, to, to function properly. And the mitochondrial DNA encodes a small number of genes involved in and required for energy production. So the nuclear genome is inherited from both parents, from the mother and from the father, whereas the mitochondrial genome is inherited only from our mothers. Now, once this fertilized egg begins to develop, it divides successively over the course of the first um, four days of life. And then on day four, it forms a moila. At that stage, it begins to differentiate to form a blastocyst. And the blastocyst is the stage at which an embryo becomes capable of implanting. So it will hatch out of this outer shell and implant on the wall of the uterus. So at the transition from moira to blastocyst, we get the first differentiation into cells that will form extra embryonic tissues and cells that will form the embryo proper. So the outer layer here is called the trophectoderm, and that will develop to form the placenta. And here in this inner cell mass, we've got cells that will form the hyperblast, the yolk sac, eventually the yolk sac. And then we've got cells that, con that, that are ep called epiblast cells, and these contribute to the fetus if, if the embryo implants it successfully. Uh, or if it, it, we can remove them from, from the embryo in the lab and we can culture them to form embryonic stem cells, which can be cultured indefinitely in vitro. Now, the remarkable thing about the human blastocyst is that it contains very few epiblast cells, very few progenitors that will give rise to the fetus. And when we look at these, these blastocysts and, use, and, and stain them for a marker of epiblast cells, we see that there are only about 5 to 15 in each blastocyst and remarkably, these give rise to, to, to all the cell types of, of the human body. So we've gone from fertilized egg to embryo ready to implant. Now we're going to go talk about how these immature eggs are formed, going from embryo to egg. <clears throat> So germ cells enable the transmission of genetic material from one generation to the next. And about three to five weeks after fertilization, primordial germ cells um, begin to migrate from the, to the gonadal ridge. And in the case of females, they will proliferate and differentiate to form oocytes. And that begins from the end of, of the first trimester of pregnancy such that baby girls are born with their lifetime supply of, of, of oocytes. Now, if we look at these oocytes, there really are remarkable cells. Here's a letter micrograph, micrograph of, a, of, a, of, a, of a human immature oocyte as it's, as it's formed during fetal life. Here we've got um, the, the oocyte surrounded by a layer of, of somatic cells to form a primordial follicle. It's got a very large nucleus, and here you can see the mitochondria in the cytoplasm. And using a different imaging technique, here we see a, a mouse primordial follicle. Here's the, the, the very large um, nucleus of the oocyte. Here's the small margin of cytoplasm here in, in the dark um, area. And here you can see the mitochondria in red. Um, <clears throat> and we're, we're particularly interested in how during this very long interval, from their formation during fetal life until they're ovulated, how these oocytes actually safeguard the integrity of their mitochondrial and nuclear genomes. So these, the, this, the, the, this pool of, of oocytes present at birth, they're recruited for growth on an ongoing basis throughout life. This pool becomes depleted, uh, culminating in the menopause. Then from, pu but from puberty to, to menopause, in response to cyclical hormonal triggers, the follicles in which the, uh, in which the oocytes grow, 
become capable of developing to a pre-ovulatory stage. And within those, the egg, the oocyte matures to form a mature egg, which is eventually released um, and, uh, and will be fertilized if, 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 if the sperm are, are, are available. So the oocyte is one of the oldest cells in the body. So by the time this egg is ovulated, it will be as old as the woman who ovulates it. It also grows to be the, 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 the largest cell in the body. The increase in humans, there's about a 60-fold increase in volume from this stage, the primordial stage, until the, the egg is fully grown. And female fertility is finite. So this pool of oocytes present at birth becomes depleted, and we refer to this process as ovarian aging. So <clears throat> the things that can go wrong. So the, the, the mitochondrial and nuclear genome are both mat maternally inherited, and things can go wrong with both of these genomes. In relation to the nuclear genome, if this fertilized egg contains the incorrect number of chromosomes, there's a 95% chance that the error, the chromosomal error, will have, will, have, will have occurred in the egg. And as women get older, there's a very much increased risk that they will transmit either too few or too many chromosomes to the fertilized egg, and this will in fact affect embryo viability. And in relation to the mitochondrial genome, if a woman carries a pathogenic mutation in her mitochondrial DNA, then she is, is at risk of transmitting serious disease to her children. The, the reproductive consequences of female aging, and this, is the, this effect is on the, nuclear, on the nuclear genome. So <clears throat> here we have on the x-axis, we have female age. And we see the, on the, in the blue line here, we've got clinical pregnancy rate. So from the mid thirties onwards, that declines dramatically. And the incidence of trisomy also increases, increases dramatically from the, from, 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 the, from the mid thirties onwards. By trisomy, we mean an extra copy of a chromosome. And here we have the incidence of miscarriage, which also, is, also shows an age-related increase. So things go very wrong from the mid-30s. Um, <clears throat> if we look here at this trisomy, we've got uh, trisomy 16 in the blue. This is the most common chromosomal cause of miscarriage. That, that, is, that is prone to error even at, young, even at younger ages, but the incidence uh, increases uh, as women from, from the mid-30s onwards. Similarly, trisomy 21, which causes Down syndrome, trisomy 18, which causes Edwards syndrome, both show a dramatic increase from the mid-30s. This is important because our um, statistics tell us that from the late 70s onwards, the proportion of women, of babies born to women over the age of, of 35 years has increased steadily. And in 20, uh, statistics from 2017, show us that 4.3% of babies born to women in the UK, uh, that 4.3% of babies born in the UK were born to women aged between 40 and 45 years. So there is an increasing tendency to delay um, childbearing. And it's important to note that these problems cannot be rescued by, by IVF treatment. So IVF treatment is effective, in, in younger women, there's a 30%, uh, over, more than 30% uh, pregnancy rate per cycle. But by the time we get to 40, that goes to around the 10% mark. The only way we can, we can really help is to use uh, eggs donated by younger women. So the orange bar here is showing you the pregnancy rate if we use a woman's own eggs. And the purple bar is showing you the pregnancy rate if we use eggs, or, or the life birth rate, I should say, if we use eggs donated by a woman aged less than 35 years. So the, the age effect is rescued by using eggs from, dirt, from, from, from younger women. And this tells us conclusively that the problems we see are due to a problem of aging. So what goes wrong with these eggs? And in order to understand that, 
we're going to need to understand the process by which sperm and eggs can generate a single copy of each chromosome to transmit to, 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 the, to the next generation. So the first step in, 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 in meiosis, and in, in females this occurs in utero, um, the first step in most organisms is that the mom and the dad homologs, these are the chromosomes that we inherit from our moms and dads at the time of fertilization. These undergo replication so that you get sister chromatids. So you have two copies of each chromosome here. And then the homologs become linked by a pro during meiotic recombination and they become linked as a consequence of exchanging DNA. And this, this structure then is called a bivalent chromosome, and that's stabilized by cohesin loaded in the premeiotic S phase. Um, <clears throat> and this cohesin holds the sister chromatids together and thereby stabilizes the structure. If we lose cohesin from the arm here, this structure, will, the, the two homologs will come apart. So this, this bivalent chromosome remains until the oocyte undergoes the first meiotic division, and that happens just shortly before ovulation in the, in the, in, in the adult female. So the bivalent chromosome will align on the first meiotic spindle. The spindle is the apparatus that enables chromosomes to segregate. It aligns on the first meiotic spindle, and in oocytes, this division is highly asymmetric. So the, the oocyte has the challenge of having to lose half of its chromosomes while retaining most of its cytoplasm. And the cytoplasm contains the resources it will need to support early embryonic develop, development. So this separation of, of so the, 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 the bivalents align, then once they're all aligned, you get an enzyme called separase that comes and cleaves the cohesin from the arms that enables the homologs to separate and half of them are lost in the polar body. And this, this loss, whether it's the mom or the dad that's lost is a random, a random, random event, it seems, in humans. And the remaining chromosomes remain, stay in the oocyte and align on the second meiotic spindle. And in order to be able to do that, they've got to protect cohesion at the centromeres. Right? The centromere is, 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 is the part part of the chromosome where it can attach to the spindle and is essential for its separation, to its, its, its division. So cohesin at the centromeres is protected by a protein, protein is called shigoshin. Shigoshin is the Japanese for guardian protector. In the case of oocytes, it's this protein shigoshin like two that protects centromeric cohesin and that is essential if these chromosomes are going to align again on the second meiotic spindle. Um, then they remain arrested at this stage until the egg is fertilized and the, the, the fertilizing sperm triggers completion of meiosis. The final piece of cohesion here at the centromeres is removed and the chromosomes segregate. Half of them are lost again in the second polar body and we're left with a single copy, that single copy maternal genome that will be enclosed in the pronucleus to form the fertilized egg. Um, and this in, uh, the, the fertilizing sperm will also, of course, bring a single copy genome. So the faithful segregation of, of a single copy genome depends on the maintenance of, of cohesin to stabilize this bivalent chromosome and on its stepwise removal, first from arms during the first meiotic division and next from centromeres during the second meiotic division. Now, the, 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 the real challenge with female meiosis is that these bivalent chromosomes are formed decades before they are to be, before they, 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 they are to be resolved. Um, and what, what we and others have found is that during female aging, oocyte chromosomes gradually lose their cohesion. So instead of having a, a, a nice structure to segregate on the first meiotic spindle, We've got this rather loose bivalent, which has a high risk of forming misattachments and missegregating. So with age, we get depletion of cohesin. And what we also found was that when cohesin is depleted, we get reduced recruitment of its, of its protector, shigoshin, so that this, this, this amplifies the effect of cohesin loss and provides a robust mechanism to sabotage fertility in older females. 
So our current thinking is that in female reproductive aging, we have two clocks ticking. The first is the one that I spoke about initially. It's the ovarian aging. It's the depletion of the pool of primordial follicles that were present at birth. And, <clears throat> and that, that culminates in the menopause. And then we have chromosomal aging, which, 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 which correlates with a loss of cohesion. Here we've got the meiotic cohesion rec protein REC8 stained in green. Uh, this is a mouse chromosome, and you can see here it's nicely holding these sisters together, these sisters together. And then this is from a 15-month-old mouse, and there's very much reduced cohesion, and there's this uh, very loose structure here. Um, so, so chromosomal age, so uh, depletion of the ovarian pool culminates in the med in the menopause. But about a decade before the menopause uh, occurs, we see the effects of this chromosomal aging. In, in, in the form of an increased incidence of chromosome segregation errors in oocytes. And whether there are any intervention strategy, strategies to reduce the risk of chromosomal errors in oocytes of older women is currently unclear and is probably unlikely to be successful because this cohesion that confers the cohesion between chromatids can only be loaded in the pre-meiotic gas phase, which occurs in fetal life. So it, it's, our research in this area is indicating that there's not a lot can be done and that female aging and the, and the consequences for female fertility is really a question of um, uh, public health. It's a public health issue in which um, women, we need to be sure that young women are being educated about the risks of their fertility with age, and also to introduce sort of societal structures that would enable women to have their children at younger ages. As we've mentioned, the fertilized egg contains about 500,000 copies of mitochondrial DNA. Um, and this, the mitochondrial genome is a very tiny circular genome. It encodes 37 genes, 13 of them are proteins, and they're all required for energy production. And the energy, uh, as we mentioned earlier, the en energy production is a major job of the mitochondria. And if any of these genes are mutated, then there is a chance that we will have deficits in, 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 in energy production. Um, <clears throat> and it primarily affects high energy requiring tissues such as the brain, the heart, the muscle, cause a broad spectrum of multi-system diseases and disease onset can occur in childhood or later in life. It's estimated to affect one in 5,000 adults and crucially there are no curative treatments. Now the inheritance of mitochondrial DNA disease is complicated by the fact that mu mutated mitochondrial DNA coexists with normal mitochondrial DNA in our cells for most diseases. And the severity of disease symptoms is largely determined by the relative levels of mutated to normal mitochondrial DNA. And crucially, from our perspective, women who carry these mutations produce eggs with widely varying mutation loads. And that then makes it extremely difficult to predict the risk of, of, of disease transmission. It's, it's very difficult to know whether they have a child who has very low mutation load and no symptoms, or whether they have a child who has a very high mutation load and develop serious disease. Reproductive technologies that can help this, there is already this pre-implantation genetic testing. So in that, a woman will undergo IVF treatment. She will produce a number of eggs. We will make embryos from those eggs. And then once they get to the eight cell stage, we will remove one of the uh, um, cells of the embryo and send it to the diagnostic lab who will measure the mutation load. And that allows, allows us to, to identify embryos with the lowest mutation loads for replacement in the uterus. So that treatment is very useful in reducing risk, but is only useful in cases where, where women are likely to produce embryos with low mutation loads. It's not suitable for those whose, whose eggs consistently contain high mutation loads. So for these women, we have developed this, this idea of replacing the mitochondria um, in the eggs. So the concept is that we would remove the nuclear DNA and place it in the egg of, of, of a non-affected donor. 
And this can be done in principle before the egg is fertilized or after fertilization. We have focused on the uh, 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 on, on removal of the nuclear genetic material after the egg is fertilized, simply because when we started with this work, we um, <clears throat> this this it was the the at this stage this pronuclear transplantation had been performed in animals and the most evidence was available for this approach. So this is the one that we, we chose to, to, to follow. So the idea in the context of clinical treatment is that you get eggs from, you, you, you stimulate the uh, ovaries of the patient and the donor, you harvest the eggs, then you inject sperm into both, you allow the pronuclei, you allow them to fertilize, you identify the pronuclei, remove the pronuclei from the patient egg, remove the pronuclei from the donor egg, then the donor egg pronuclei are no longer required. Uh, we just use the cytoplasm here, this enucleated zygote. Uh, we fuse the, uh, the patient nuclear DNA with the egg, with the enucleated egg, and this gives us a, a reconstituted embryo containing the nuclear DNA from the, the affected woman and her partner, and predominantly the mitochondrial DNA from the um, unaffected donor. And I say predominantly because when we remove these pronuclei, we, 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 we remove some, we, rem, we remove this, we inevitably take some of the cytoplasm surrounding the, the nucleus as well. And this will generally contain some mitochondria. So a small amount of mitochondria from the patient is also, is also, um, contained in this reconstituted embryo. Now, we spent quite a lot of years uh, optimizing this procedure. And after much work, we find that greater than 90% of these manipulated zygotes will, will survive the procedure. And 40% of those develop to the blastocyst stage. That's somewhat lower than conventional IVF techniques, but it is, um, it is reasonable development. We are still working towards improving that, and I will um, come back to that in the next few slides. But first, I want to show you this. My colleague, Louise Hislop, who optimized this procedure for translation to the clinic. Here you see her removing a pronucleus here, and then she goes back in for the next one. And now she places them under the zona, this outer shell of the enucleated donor egg, and they fuse very quickly. Um, and that's how we do this procedure. So the question of whether pronuclear transfer prevents mitochondrial disease really depends on how much of this patient mitochondrial DNA we co-transplant. So we call this mitochondrial DNA carryover. And really, that, the, the, the amount of that can be variable for, for a variety of reasons. And here you can see uh, the pronuclei contained in the pipette, the pronucleus contained in the pipette in which it was, it was removed. This has a very small amount of cytoplasm, and this one here has more. And, and the amount of cytoplasm we take really depends on the orientation, how difficult it is to get at the, at the, at the, at the, at the pronuclei in the zygote. But when we measure then, when we allow these reconstituted embryos to develop to the blastocyst stage and we disaggregate them, so we can measure the, the, the mitochondrial DNA carryover in different compartments, we found that reproducibly less than 5% of them had, had uh, that less than 5% of the mitochondrial DNA um, was derived from the, from the nuclear donor. Um, and, uh, almost half of them had no detectable mitochondrial DNA from the nuclear donor at all. <clears throat> However, when we then made embryonic stem cells, I mentioned this earlier, we can take out this inner cell mass and we can grow embryonic stem cells from them. We found that 20, almost 20% 20 of these lines um, reverted to the patient mitochondrial genome. So this tiny fraction of mitochondrial DNA that we co-transferred with the nuclear genome actually took over and seemed to outcompete the, 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 the um, mitochondrial DNA from the donor egg. Now we don't know 
exactly what's causing that. We don't, we're, we're, we don't know what the underlying mechanisms are yet, and we don't know the clinical significance, whether this could actually occur during in vivo development. But what we can conclude from this is that pronuclear transfer may not prevent mitochondrial DNA in all, in, in all cases. So our, our ongoing work is very much focused on trying to find ways of minimizing the contribution of, of this patient mitochondrial DNA. Uh, and we're looking at different approaches to that. And we're also looking at how we might improve embryo development following uh, pronuclear transfer, because we see the two major determinants of success here are, can, can the procedure have a minimal impact on, on embryo development? And can we transfer or can the contribution of the patient mitochondrial DNA also be made to be minimal? So in, in, in trying to um, look at how we might improve uh, embryo development here, we're beginning to learn a great deal more about the transition how, from, from egg to embryos in the human. Um, um, and one of the things that we have um, learned along the way is the, the strategies that the zygote uses, the that the fertilized egg uses to um, deal with this enormous nucleus, because this is about 30 microns, it's very much bigger than in any other cell. And so how do the chromosomes, how do the genomes come together before this egg has to divide to the, to the first mitotic division to, in, to enable it to become a two cell? And what we found is that these, these chromosomes cluster at the interface so that when, the, when the, these nuclear membranes break down, then we can have them all in the same place, ready to align on the first mitotic spindle. And here I can show you this. If I can find my cursor, here we go. So these are, these are the pronuclei. We're at a, a pretty late stage of development here. And then this is the first mitotic spindle. And in some, in some zygotes, they don't cluster so well, and this is actually one of them. So there we go. This is the first time that these two parental genomes will come, um, come together, is when this embryo, not when this cell now divide, divides to form the two cell embryo. So by working out what, what are, how does this happen normally during human development, we, we will be able to see very clearly what is going wrong with, what, with, the, with the pronuclear transfer. How, what is the effect of pronuclear transfer on this? And it's really only in recent years we've come to be able to um, look at the embryo in this detail. And in further developments, um, uh, um, our next step really is to develop new tools to investigate embryonic development to this, you know, right from fertilized egg to implantation stage and our, our, to use genome editing tools for this purpose. So genome editing is, enables us to alter the DNA sequence. It's useful for potentially um, correcting mutations, but also it allows us to make insertions that will allow us to study um, um, embryo development. And one of the things we, we're, we're working towards now is integrating fluorescent reporters to, to, to mark, to enable us to visualize key proteins involved in fundamental cellular processes during, during embryo development. And so we're using this CRISPR-Cas9 technology to integrate fluorescent proteins into a, a variety of key proteins. And this, this was, this was um, first reported in mouse embryos by, the, by Janet Rossent in 20, 2018. And we're now working as part of the Human Developmental Biology Initiative to adapt this technique to, 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 mouse, to human embryos. Um, and what we aim to do is to be able to look at chromosome segregating during development and to be able to look at how the embryo differentiates into the different lineages. 
And this will help us better understand the causes of infertility and developmental defects. It will improve the efficiency of current treatments because we think we can look at the effect of these interventions more clearly. And of course, it will help us to accelerate the development of new treatments by being able to go in and look into the embryo and see directly what the effect of these interventions are. So <clears throat> with that, I would like to um, acknowledge the great work of these two remarkable women, Anne McLaren, a de developmental biologist, and Mary Warnock, a philosopher, who was part of their work as the, on the Warnock Commission, Committee, um, set the framework for research uh, on human embryos in the UK. And I think we're very fortunate here to have a very robust system of regulation that is permissive to progress in this field. And um, we owe great debt of gratitude to these two women for that, for that reason. And finally, I would like to acknowledge the many people in my lab who have contrib contributed to this work, our collaborators uh, in Newcastle and collaborators elsewhere. And this team of um, colleagues, Mina Chowdhury, Alison Murdoch, who pioneered the egg donation program in Newcastle and the research nurses who, who, who coordinate that. And finally, I would really like to thank the women who have donated their eggs to this research and to thank you for your attention. And of course, our funders, many thanks. And we're here live with our speaker. Thank you very much, Mary, for a wonderful paper. Thank you. Uh, immensely detailed and obviously profoundly serious uh, things we're discussing. I'm very curious listening to you and watching the slides, what you think of the reporting of these and related subjects in the media. So it has improved hugely over the last decade or more. Um, I think after the genetic modification of crops sort of fiasco. Um, the Science Media Center was established and that's a forum where scientists can get together with journalists to discuss, to, to report their findings and take questions from the journalists. And I think since that, since that started, it's been really, really markedly improved. And I think by now, very, the press media are very well informed, I think, on the techniques that we've been working on anyway. And this presumably is something which the pandemic has improved, the, the level of science reporting specialists, correspondents and so on. Oh, indeed, over the pandemic, it's become quite, yeah, something else, I think. <laughs> it's, it's an ill wind that blows nobody good. Yeah, um, and indeed, true. you're speaking from the place I received my uh, booster at the weekend, so it's all, all coming together, as indeed are the questions. Uh, our first question comes from James, who asks, how widely accepted or legalised is the nuclear transfer technique around the world? So it's been legalized in the UK. Um, the Australians are in the process. They're having parliamentary debates about it now. I think there was a vote just a few days back and it's gone through the, the equivalent of the House of Commons in Australia and still needs to go through the equivalent of the House of Lords as I understand it. So there's been no, there was some discussion in the US but it got stuck on some fiscal debate. So the FDA had convened a meeting to consider um, introducing mitochondrial replacement techniques, but was stalled for some political reason and they were no longer allowed to consider it. So that was stopped. Now there are a few places in Europe offering this, these sort of procedures for fertility reasons, but it's not in a very highly, the regulation was not as um, subject to scrutiny as here, I believe. Dare I raise the B word? Has, has, has Brexit or will Brexit impact on any of these matters? I, I don't 
think so. Not, not immediately. I mean, if we were to have, and we do get inquiries from all over the world, but you know, that, you know, there was always the um, business of how we deal with, with those as, you know, they're obviously not eligible for NHS treatment and so on. So I, I don't think there's an immediate impact of Brexit on this. Uh, our next question comes from Kate, who asks, what are your thoughts on the practice of egg freezing? Should this become the norm for women who choose to delay having a child? So it's a, it's a, it's a backup, I think, but not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take it as the default option. I think my own view is if a woman reaches her, you know, into her early thirties and it looks like there's not, you know, like, like, the conditions in which to found a family are not, not immediately um, sort of apparent that then to think about egg freezing. But I think, you know, in general, it's better to do it the natural way, if at all possible. A question from Sarah. Uh, do environmental factors also have an effect on ovarian aging? I'm trying to think of, of, of a case. So there, so there is a, colleague of mine in the US who works on um, she works on she works with it collaborates with a group in India and there seems to be an effect of some pollutants there really in the in the water um, but I'm not expert on this but apart from that I'm not sure of any other environmental conditions that would affect ovarian aging uh, just to remind our viewers that you can ask uh, questions or raise comments uh, via the chat box on the YouTube page or on Twitter using our handle at InsightsNCL. And you can use the hashtag at InsightsNCL. Uh, as indeed has Karina, who asks, do you think it will be possible in the future to create a viable embryo with two eggs? So I, I think that would be a long way off because we need... So the male and... The, the paternal and maternal genomes are subject to different sort of epigenetic modifications. So the gene expression will be regulated in different ways. And that seems to be very much defined by the fact that it is a paternal genome. So the process of what we call imprinting certain genes to know whether they will be, to determine whether they will be expressed or not, is, is differs between the two parental genomes. So if we had two female genomes, we wouldn't get this, two maternal genomes, this, this imprinting would be expected to be, to be um, faulty. Uh, Jennifer uh, asks, what do you see as the future possibilities for mitochondrial replacement? So in, in this country, it's legal only for the purposes of preventing transmission of serious mitochondrial DNA disease. So that's the only reason we're allowed to use it. <clears throat> now, you know, it is, it is the same, similar techniques are being used um, elsewhere for treatment of infertility. Um, and there may be certain causes of infertility um, that might benefit from this, but I'm not sure it's very much to do with the mitochondria. So for example, when an egg is fully grown and it, it, it has assembled all of the messenger RNA it needs to direct future development. And in some cases, if that process is faulty, then you might benefit from going, you know, trans, transplanting the, gene, the nuclear genome to a donor egg. Um, so this is what they call a maternal effect. If all of the transcripts aren't there to direct future development, and that might typically be, be manifest as reduced development to the blastocyst stage. So there, I wouldn't rule out the possibility that it might be useful in some cases, but I don't think it's a lot to do with the mitochondria. Thank you. Uh, Michelle asks, uh, to what extent should lawmakers have a role in scientific advancements such as these, i.e. preventing, quote, designer babies and human enhancements? I think, I think it's, it's very important, actually. I think the fact that this is so... I mean, the regulation of our, of, of our field in the UK is very robust. Um, and I think that's very important. Um, but it also allows it to be permissive um, to progress. Um, and so I do think that the regulation is really important. 
and and that reg regulation is you know the framework for it is in the legislation so you might ask whether so whether there needs to be such a detailed um, um, legal framework that's another question but the principle of it being enshrined of of of, of our, our field being well reg regulated i think is very very important are there particular areas where you yourself uh, engage with um, politicians and public bodies on matters of, of contentious or controversial natures? Yeah, so we would be, um, you know, if we were looking for a review of the Act, for example, when we were introducing the, when we were developing the mitochondrial replacement procedures, then that was initially um, not allowed by UK law. It was even unclear as to whether we could do it for research because of some very poor wording in the legislation. Um, so it took about 18 months battling with the regulator in order to get a research license because um, they thought that what we wanted to do would, 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 would not be in accordance with the law at that time. But that was, they eventually agreed uh, to let us go ahead with the research. And then the law had to be changed for, um, to, to let it be used in clinical treatment. Um, and then there were ongoing discussions, the, the Human Fertilization and Embryology Act is come, expected to come up for review again in the coming year. And there will be other areas that people want to revisit and we will certainly um, be contributing to that. So it's, it's, a, it's an ongoing, ongoing sort of process while the law catches up with the technologies and the requirements. Mm. I mean, this is an example of, of a public facing activity that you do. I mean, what's the extent of your in involvement with the, the wider community in, in discussing, disseminating your research and dealing with concerns? So in, in, this, in this run of age, what is, the, what is the, um, the level of knowledge? So there were four focus groups set up with um, people just picked at random from the street or, um, and then over two Saturdays, they got information on the, the scientific process and the ethical background and so on. Um, and, and so that was very much gauging what's people, what, what is the interest of people and what information do they need or what is the current level of knowledge and what information do they need to be able to enhance their understanding. So at that level, very interesting. We've done a lot of public debates, obviously, and um, um, uh, media interviews and so on. So there's been... Uh, a great deal of putting it out there for the mitochondrial donation. And I think it's part of the, so, so now we have funding as part of the Welcome Human Developmental Biology Initiative. And that is a 10 million pound grant across several labs in the UK. And there is very much a focus on public engagement in that. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is an appetite for expertise after all. Um, question mm -hmm. from YouTube. <laughs> There has been a discovery of stem cells that can develop to eggs in an adult woman. If this is possible, what could it mean for the future of fertility treatments? So this business of there being stem cells in the ovary that can give rise to, to eggs and oocytes, that is, that is a bit controversial. Um, however, there is, because yes, that, that bit is controversial. However, there is progress being made in generating oocytes from ES cells. Um, that's been, been really very much spearheaded by a group in Japan. I think we're making great progress in, these because, in this because the process is inefficient, but they're going back and saying, well, why is it so inefficient? And in that space, you learn a great deal about, about the process of oocyte formation. I think the field so far has been bedeviled by people saying, oh, we can make oocytes, we can make oocytes, we've worked the magic. But, 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 but this group in Japan, um, led by a guy called Hayashi, he's very much saying, what, is, what are the problems here and what can we do to address them? And we're really learning a huge amount from his work. So, you know, previously I would have been sceptical, but now I'm less so. Uh, Ilani asks, could mitochondrial donation lead to new genetic diseases or mutations? Um, no. I don't, there's, there's no major reason to believe it would lead to new genetic diseases. So what you're doing is you're putting um, the nuclear genome as it exists into the enucleated egg, the cytoplasm of, from a donor egg. So those two genomes themselves are unaltered. So the nuclear genome of the, of the, of the affected woman, if you like, and her partner would be unchanged. 
The mitochondrial genome of the donor is sequenced to ensure that there aren't any pathogenic mutations in there or any um, disease associated uh, variants. So in that sense, we're, we are not doing anything that would change the genome in itself. We're just Thank creating new mixes. Uh, there's one more question coming in. Uh, I've been informed, and it's from Alex, and he asks, or she asks, uh, how did you go about establishing a fertility clinic in the Northeast? And do you think there is a demand for embryologists in the UK? Okay, so the first bit is there is a demand for embryologists in the UK. Um, the training has become very much formalized and it's quite difficult to get into those training uh, um, uh, schemes, um, but certainly embryologists are in demand. Setting up a clinic in the Northeast. Um, so I came on the scene um, a very long time ago. <laughs> and, um, at that stage, Alice Murdoch, who was the medical lead here for many years, she had set up a fertility service offering various treatments. And then I moved from London and we got uh, set up an IVF lab from very, very small beginnings indeed. Um, I, and we just bootstrapped our way. In. And it took... I took a bit of bravery that wasn't all of mine, I have to say. Alison um, was a very pioneering spirit in this. And got, and it's, I mean, I think here we're very well funded by the NHS for IVF treatments. So it has been a great success and an enormous pleasure to watch it grow, actually. Wonderful. Leveling up in an early, an earlier era. Uh, that's all we have time for. Uh, thank you very much, Mary Herbert, for your talk this evening. Pleasure. Thank you very much. And thank you for watching. Um, we go away now for the Christmas break and return in the new year with the Holmes Memorial Lectures for 10 to 14 year olds, our futures in STEM. But to keep you entertained over Christmas, we have a library of over 250 insights lectures, which you can watch on our website. We hope you have a great break and look forward to seeing you in 2022.